Good afternoon and welcome to our December Bulkley Valley Research Center seminar series. So great to have everyone with us today. My name is Dawn Hansen. I'm the executive director of the Bulkley Valley Research Center. And the seminar series is something that we quite enjoy, especially being able to reach people <clears throat> virtually. And we are hopeful for the new year to be um, able to have some hybrid. So we're in person and having presenters and participants join us virtually. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm hosting today from the traditional territory of the Gidimden Bear Wolf Clan of the Wet'suwet'en Nation. And I'm currently in Taupa on the banks of the Bulkley River. I'd also like to thank our funders who helped make this series possible. The uh, Bulkley Valley Credit Union, the Bulkley Valley Community Foundation, the Provincial Gaming Grant Funding <coughs> System, as well as the um, Wet'suwet'en Community Forest Corporation. They are... Um, uh, great supporters of the Research Center and so many other um, community organizations as well. And we are really pleased today to have Alan Banner presenting. He is uh, moved south. He's migrated south for the cold weather, but they have more snow than, uh, than we do up in Smithers right now. He was previously a longtime Bulkley Valley resident and a longtime forest ecologist. Uh, he and his partner, Dell, who worked on this paper together, are uh, both retired, striving for an ideal balance between being retired and still doing some work and uh, continuing to contribute to better understanding, managing and conserving the diverse forest landscapes of the province. And uh, we appreciate your wisdom and your ongoing work and uh, your contributions. Thanks so much, Alan, and go ahead. Thanks very much, Don. Uh, it's great to uh, see all some all those familiar uh, names and uh, some faces um, from uh, my past and uh, old friends. And I'm happy to be talking to you today. I'm in Campbell River now. I'm on the unceded territory of the Likata people. And that includes the uh, Rewakai and the Rewakum and the uh, Kweka First Nations. And I'm actually looking right across at Cape Mudge on, on Quadra Island here from my office. So. Yes, I'm going to get right into this because, uh, you know, we've got an action packed talk and um, I want to make sure I got some time at the end for questions. So I'll try not to rattle on too much about any particular slide, but um, I'm going to get right into it. So uh, old growth and beyond assessing ecosystem integrity and landscapes managed for forestry. And Dal and I myself have been involved in a few projects in the last few years together uh, working on <clears throat> well, these ones specifically assessing uh, ecosystem integrity, particularly in um, second growth forests, um, as well as old growth forests. And um, so today's talk, uh, here's a bit of an outline. I'm gonna first of all, go through some concepts just so we're on the same page on some definitions, a little bit of background and history on um, sort of uh, integrity, ecosystem integrity involvement in forest management in BC. And then I'm gonna get right into a couple of um, practical examples that we've been working on, a couple of tools of assessing ecosystem integrity at the one more at the stand level on the ground and um, another one using a GIS approach and we'll finish off with a bit of comments on some further work and applications as, as we see them and hopefully leave uh, 10, 10 minutes or so for questions as long as I don't uh, get carried away here. So first of all, some concepts. Here's uh, four terms that I'm gonna just uh, talk about in some little bit of detail here. First of all, ecological integrity. There are many uh, uh, definitions of this in the literature, but here's one. The ability of an ecological system to support and maintain a community of organisms that has species composition, diversity, and functional organization comparable to those of natural habitats within the region. So that's one definition. And as I say, there are many. So kind of like keep all the pieces, as Aldo said many years ago, uh, all the cogs in the wheel, the state of being whole, dictionary, uh, definition. So, and, and when we speak of ecological integrity, more of a kind of a landscape approach, multiple elements and scales from individual stands to the landscape. And we talk about things like habitat, wildlife diversity, repairing and wetland function, connectivity, today carbon uptake and storage, of course. So the things that kind of link all the ecosystems in a landscape and make it a whole and make it function as we would expect it to. Some important and diverse ecological values within the forest landscape. So that's kind of a you know, gen generally talking about a, a ecologically healthy um, landscape and 
we can also use another term, ecosystem, ecosystem integrity, uh, dealing with things a little more um, specifically. So kind of a component or subset of ecological integrity that we um, assess at the, at the stand or, or polygon level using a bunch of attributes. And I've list, listed some here that um, many, most of you would be uh, you know, familiar with. Stand age, of course, and, and disturbance history. Stand structure, all the structure, structural aspects of a, of a forest that give it um, a, a diversity of, of uh, habitats and substrates for organisms to get um, colonized, uh, you know, to get established on. Um, so structure is an extremely important aspect. And uh, things like canopy gaps that give rise to uh, understory vegetation communities, not only, not only the understory vegetation, but epiphytic communities in the, in the trees, one of the, one of the uh, elements of ecosystem recovery that takes one of the, you know, takes longer to, 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 to happen. Things like size and landscape context. So, you know, is there interior, are there interior forest conditions? What's, what's happening around that ecosystem uh, in terms of its landscape context? Is it all mature and old or is it disturbed habitats? And we can't really talk about integrity without talking about the soil, although we're not gonna deal too much too specifically with that today, but um, of course it's the foundation of the ecosystem. It uh, determines, you know, moisture and nutrient regimes and ultimately productivity and all the biological activities that go on there. The, 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 the mycorrhizal webs, etc. So, um, yeah, it's it's an important, obviously, an important component of the uh, of the ecosystem. So, a couple of other terms: recovery and resilience, which are kind of linked to integrity. We think about ecosystem recovery as the degree of development of old forest conditions through succession, following following disturbance. And I just list a, a few papers there that we've worked on over the years, myself and Phil LePage and. Erica Lillies, Karen Price, looking at various aspects of recovery, understory vegetation, the recovery of structural elements in stands, and um, the, the, the epiphytic communities, bryophyte and lichen communities and trees. And as I say, that's often the, the takes the longest to recover after a disturbance. Resilience, the ability of an ecosystem to absorb external influences and, and remain intact. And so these days we're thinking about climate change and the uh, impact of you know, a diverse ecosystem on the, uh, having the ability to, to, to face change and, and, st and remain intact. So you know, those are just some terms that I'll probably mention throughout the talk, um, just to kind of keep in mind. And, and I just wanna quickly go through a little bit of background history in BC. Um, integrity, ecological integrity has kind of been in, implicit in a lot of different policies and initiatives going back many, many decades. And kind of a benchmark of that is the adoption of biochromatic classification. By the, by the province, the, the, uh, our, um, our main man there, um, Vladimir Karina, developed that system and it was take, taken over by the government. Our, uh, and it was the beginning of the ecology program way back when, and many of us, you know, we got our career, ecology careers out of that. <clears throat> got a chance to uh, get to know the forest of the province reasonably well. And it kind of put forth the ecosystem as the Fundamental unit of forest management, field guides and maps, et cetera, interpretations, uh, you know, tree species selection guidelines, et cetera. All those things came out of that. But the same, round about the same time, by physical classification, ecoregions and ecosections, more of a wildlife habitat um, bent on that. Conservation data center, you know, the at risk ecosystems in the early 90s, that was formed. And they actually explicitly used uh, ecosystem integrity to rank element occurrences of, of these um, rare and at-risk ecosystems and uh, came up with some sort of definitions of, you know, poor, fair, good, and excellent um, integrity, which we're still using today. Uh, biodiversity guidebook, forest practices, code, ecosystem-based management. I'm going to talk more about EBM in a, in, a, in a minute or two. Protected areas strategy, and then their old growth strategies. And of course, we've just had another one in 2020. And uh, et cetera. So there's been a lot of stuff going on in the province, to kind of dealing with ecological input into forest management. And, you know, in many ways, we we wished it had gone further. And many many of these uh, initiatives didn't quite go as far as we may have hoped. Um, and here we are in 2022, and we just had another old growth review, calling for a paradigm shift. And I kind of think of that as kind of a further or continuing emphasis on managing for diverse ecological values, not just timber. So, you know, we're not starting from scratch. We, we've, sometimes I listen to the, the news and I think, yeah, geez, it sounds like we're starting from scratch in this province, but we're not. We've done a lot. We've got a lot to build on. And um, so it's, it's, it's up to, you know, um, 
the government and others now to, to take it to the next level. Yeah. So things like the importance of forest, forest uh, to the carbon budget, of course, it's very high, highly relevant these days. Sinks, carbon sinks, and um, storage um, ready to climate change. Co-management with the First Nations, kind of the melding of traditional knowledge and um, institutional science is also top of the list. And of course, old growth is kind of the focus of forest conservation as the amount of remaining old, old growth declines. And we're all having conversations about that. And it's, uh, you know, most days there's something on that on the, on the, on the, on the radio. So someone's being interviewed on that topic. But the contribution of second growth, regenerating forests, of which there are many in the province to uh, ecological integrity of, of, our, of our forest landscapes, um, probably hasn't received as much attention. In fact, often you hear, yeah, there's lots of second growth, so why are we logging old growth? And, and um, with, without much consideration for, well, that, that second growth is actually contributing to uh, the ecological integrity as well. So, And we can even consider management practices uh, to improve integrity in second growth stands, like um, structural complexity enhancement. And, and there's been quite a bit of work done on that as well. There's an outfit in the States called um, the uh, forest, uh, uh, what are they called? Uh, anyways, there's, uh, uh, there's some, some good videos and, and some good papers on uh, structural complexity enhancement. So getting to some specifics here, some tools for assessing, assessing ecosystem integrity. And here's a couple of projects that uh, Dell and myself have, and many others have worked on. One dealing at the stand level and the other at the GIS uh, level, more of, a, more of an extensive approach. And I'm going to get right into the first one, Land Management, uh, Land Management Handbook 72, which uh, was produced in 2019, uh, although it, we started on it a few years before that. Guidelines to support Im implementation of the Great Bear Rainforest Order with respect to old forests and listed plant communities. So this was produced by myself, Dell, and uh, Bob Green, Sari Sanders, others. Heather Clausen was also heavily involved in this uh, from the coast region, helped out with accumulating a lot of information for this. And the um, uh, uh, ecosystem, the, the um, EBM working group, which involved industry and First Nations and environmental groups, provincial government. I mean, there was a lot of hashing out to, to get this work done, agreeing on what it should contain and um, uh, you know, editing and back and forth. And anyways, we produced it and um, we were happy with the result. It, uh, it deals with this area, the EBM area on the coast, which I think is around 6.4 million hectares of, of forest, uh, forest and uh, subalpine and alpine um, areas, um, stretching from you know, near Prince Rupert down as far south as Discovery Islands areas here. And the southern part actually is sort of transitioning to the drier coastal western hemlock subzones where there's actually very, you know, relatively little old forest left. So, same time, there's older second growth because of the longer history of, of forest harvesting, and so there's there's stands that that um, have potential for recruitment, and uh, that's to a large part what our field guide dealt with. Um, and I'm just going to go through some of the uh, the context here. Uh, the 2016 Great Bear Rainforest Order it legislates protection for a bunch of different things, but we're going to deal today with just two things: old forests and and, and listed communities. And first of all. Old forest, there's a few definitions in the order and it was up to us to kind of interpret these, and turn them into something that worked on the ground. First of all, what we think of as old forest, forest greater than 250 years old on the coast. Um, uh, in fact, most of them are, are much older than that, but that's the cutoff. Second definition, uh, dealing more with these forests that were disturbed and or harvested or, or some of them were burnt um, many years ago and they're now you know 80 100 120 140 year old forests that have still have might have some structural legacies from the uh, previous stand um old cereal remnants or uh, you know snags and rotting logs and their understories are reasonably well developed so they have many of the attributes of older forests but they're not actually old forests but for the purposes of the of the, of the order and when we're thinking about recruitment they they uh, are important uh, uh, and and we can identify them and decide, yes, that's, a, that's an old forest. A third definition, climax stands for ecosystems that cycle at less than 250 years. So these are kind of the special sites, the fluvial uh, ecosystems that have a, a more frequent disturbance regime. So there's you know, sort of three different kinds of old forest. 
And there's representation targets in the order, but and it's, it's done by site series. So the, the ecosystem classification fits into this. And so there's a, if you have to decide it's old, but you also have to figure out what, what site series it belongs to. And the second thing, red and blue listed these, these listed communities, which um, uh, are more or less the list that the Conservation Data Center has produced, although it was modified somewhat for the Great Bear Rainforest area. And this concept of sufficiently established. So uh, examples of these ecosystems that meet a, a good or better um, conservation data center integrity ranking. And uh, so we had to figure what, what that was and how do, you, how do you sort of define that on the ground? And they've got to meet criteria of age, stand structure, and certain area criteria. So, so our job tasks for the ecologists was to provide guidance on these, um, first of all, for old forest and then sufficiently established listed communities. And the two of them are related, but not exactly the same. And you know, we wanted these to be ecologically defensible. Uh, we wanted to stand behind them as ecologists, uh, operationally feasible. So we wanted to, you know, people who weren't necessarily specialists to apply this on the ground, identify these sites, and uh, of course, it had to be consistent with the intent of the uh, the order. And sometimes, you know, people sitting around a conference table coming up with what to put in the order, it, it, it sounds good, but you know, how do you how do you interpret that on the ground? And so that was our that was our job. And uh, so the guide has a set of field tools, an old forest key, a sufficiently established key, as well as a lot of background information on why and how we develop them and, and, and how to use them in the field. And both of those keys in, uh, involve something that we, that we uh, called forest attribute scoring, a FAST procedure. And that's, that's really what I'm gonna focus on today because the, the, you know, I, could, I could spend hours going over this other stuff, but um, the FAST procedure, the forest attribute scoring procedure is kind of a way of assessing a forest assessing elements of the forest that, um, that lead to uh, looking at its um, integrity, functional integrity. And uh, so that's gonna be kind of the focus. So the initial assessment in the field, of course, stand age is important, not just the, uh, the age that defines truly old, but some of these other younger age categories, 140 years, 80 years, um, you know, and what else do those forests contain to, to, to make them um, candidates for being considered as old forest. So, you know, aging is required in the field. Composition, so primarily climax species, but also including these long-lived cereal species like in the South Douglas fir often remains in these stands. And of course, the site series concepts described in the Beck guides, which um, everything is done by, by site series. So whether it's a listed community or an old forest, uh, the, you know, you gotta, you gotta figure out the classification of it. The veteran overstory tree layer is, um, uh, a really important component. Um, I'm going to get into that uh, uh, just uh, in a couple of minutes, so I won't I won't go through it here. But uh, yeah, that that's a, an important um, element that I'll describe in a minute. So a couple of keys in the guide: the for old forest key and the sufficiently established key. And this 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 is a PDF document, so it's available online, so you can go and and uh, download it and check it out. Uh, check all the details out. Uh, get some quality evening reading. Uh, with land management 72, but both these keys um, contain something called the forest attribute score uh, as, as part of that key. You may or may not use it in all parts of the key, but uh, it's, it, it is an important element. And that's again, what I'm gonna focus on here. And um, here's a sort of a layout of it. It, it, it uh, considers f uh, six different uh, attributes uh, that we would want to look at more closely when we're on the ground and trying to assess a forest. I'll just list them quickly. The, the veteran overstory tree layer um, that would be remaining from your previous stand before it was disturbed. Density of things like of snags. Vertical canopy differentiation, of course, is an important factor. Understory shrub and herb development is, um, is another thing we look at. Course woody debris and disturbance history. So these are six attributes that you know, we, we associate with, with um, um, well, the better development of these uh, attributes associated with older forests. And so what's going on in a younger forest in terms of uh, the development of these factors. So I'm just gonna go through most of these. I don't think I'm gonna cover them all, but um, I'll give you some examples. First of all, the better an overstory tree or bot layer. Um, these are large, big old trees as we would associate with old growth, uh, uh, large by height and diameter. They're defined in the keys as emergent, a1 or A2 trees, um, that's the dominant main canopy trees. They gotta be greater than 200 years old. They have to reach uh, a certain density, um, achieve a certain density, depending on the age of the stand. And we've 
we've chosen these numbers based on a literature review as well as just on our own experience and uh, coming up with these thresholds. These are mainly trees from the previous stand um, that were already dominant, but some some might be released from the previous stand. So uh, you know it was logged or uh, disturbed over 80, 100, 120 years ago. Um, some some trees that were left behind may have put on some growth and become emergent. Uh, they may be taller than the second growth stand that was established after that. This is an example of a big old Douglas fir in um, in uh, Elk Falls Park here. And my trusty dog Rusty is the botanical scale object down there in the corner. So uh, you know that's a big tree. Minimum diameter requirements: seventy centimeters on most sites, fifty centimeters on on drier sites. Um, and these are minimums, of course, most of these trees are much bigger than that. So here's a couple of examples of some big old Douglas fir. They have to meet certain uh, diameter, um, uh, as I say, diameter criteria. When we score them in the field, less than 100 centimeters and greater than 100 centimeters are a couple of categories there. So we, uh, the stand would get uh, um, certain points depending on it, how many it contained and how big they were. Here's a whole bunch of them. Uh, Douglas fir, cedar, western hemlock, Sitka spruce. Uh, what else we got? Yeah, and then you could have a Malbus fir, but you know, a, a number of different species. Most of the, the Douglas fir are usually pretty obvious. They're big old trees with gnarly bark. But things like old hemlock and cedar can they can they, they can fool you. Um, some look old and aren't old. Some are old and don't look old. Um, and so you know you have to often have to core them and uh, figure out what's going on. And I guess some of these would actually be uh, some of Suzanne's mother trees as well, right? So identification of them, here's Dell and Sari and uh, Heather putting in a, a fast plot somewhere around or here in Campbell River, I believe. Um, LIDAR is, uh, and I'm gonna talk more about LIDAR later, but it, it's, it's a useful tool for identifying these big old trees. Um, uh, you know, trees are color coded by height and these are, uh, these are LIDAR images that depicting actual trees. So you can do a pre-stratification based on this and uh, it's a handy, uh, um, a handy tool for doing that. Density of snags, of course, snags are important. Um, so we would assess them in a similar way, you know, a 0.2 hectare, fifth hectare plot, assess how many there are per hectare and uh, they have to reach certain diameter and height uh, uh, categories or uh, limits. And uh, so they would be assessed um, uh, in, in plots as well. Canopy, dif uh, canopy uh, vertical canopy differentiation. Now this is a key one. Canopy complexity is a driver of many other important ecological attributes such as understory and epiphytic um, vegetation communities. And this is, this, is, this is what gives the stands the gaps and the structural complexity that we associate with older stands. Uh, lots of habitats and substrates for colonizing organisms and, um, and just that, that structural diversity we associate with older forests. Um, and uh, we've got three categories, simple, moderate, and complex. So again, remember we wanted to keep this reasonably uh, straightforward for field practitioners. Um, and each of these has a, a, a bunch of criteria that, um, that define them. Instead of going through those in detail, I think I'll just show you some pictures. Um, so here's a simple canopy differentiation on the left uh, stand that we might be familiar with a you know a, a regenerating second growth stand that might be 80 years old. It was established quite densely, hasn't undergone um, sort of understory reinitiation yet, and not a lot of light on the ground, so the understories are relatively uh, sparse. You can contrast that with a moderate um, stand structure where there's some diameter and height uh, uh, variation in the stand, and these might that might be due to uh, some vots, uh, some veteran overstory trees, or it might just be the the history of the stand wasn't established as densely, so it's more open. And then the complex structure that we associate with old growth forests, um, where you have big old trees, lots of, lots of diameter and, and height variation, or gaps in the canopy, and uh, that would be the, the, the complex. So second growth stands are you know, often simple and moderate. Some of them, if they've got a, 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 enough veteran overstory trees in them, would actually get into the, the, a complex category, but many of them would be moderate. So if you're at a stand edge, sometimes it's, it's, it's easy to get at this. Uh, here's a simple um, structure in a, in a second row stand, more of a moderate situation here and a complex one on the right. This top one is a, a coastal uh, Sitka spruce fringe forest, which isn't all that tall, but it has quite a bit of structural complexity. So that 
that complexity gives rise to uh, you know gaps and then effects on understory vegetation and uh, understory shrub and herb development is another thing we look at. And again, three simple categories: sparse, patchy, and consistent, well developed. These all have criteria uh, you know that define them. But this is a, on the left is a situation where in a forest that's reasonably dense, there's not a lot of understory vegetation established, uh, with the exception of maybe some bryophytes and and uh, conifer regeneration. Contrast, contrast that here with a more of a patchy distribution of understory in a stand that's a little more open and a very well-developed uh, understory in the sword fern site. Um, still a second growth um, forest, but um, much more variation in um, structure and, and that sort of computes to a better, better developed understory. Here's some examples in the Southern Dry Maritime uh, 01 zonal site with Sparse understory. There's a nice example of a snag. These are these are second growth um, uh, Douglas fir trees here. A patchy understory development in a sword fern site DMO5, and then a uh, well developed understory. This this site is on the Sunshine Coast. I think it was about 110 years old. Um, this is a second growth Douglas fir, but it's uh, it's about 70 meters tall and about a meter in diameter. So there's some there's some good growth of Looks for in these southern uh, CWH subzones. Anyways, this is a it was a relatively open stand, um, uh, with with a lot of good good characteristics for a, a second growth forest. Here's a well developed understory in a XMO3 uh, dry maritime subzone of the coast of western Himalaya. Uh, again, a very well developed understory of Salal. And then, uh, you know, I think I'm skipping um, forest woody debris just because of time, but here's, here's, here's the disturbance history criteria. So conservation data centers, uh, you know, in their, in their evaluation of integrity is, is interested in the disturbance history of the stand. Um, so we would want to know whether it was a, a logging history or a, a natural disturbance like a fire or a wind throw. And there's clues, you know, old stumps, springboard stump in this case, and, uh, and fire scars in this case. So that, the, the site would be scored accordingly. Um, and that would, that would factor into the uh, integrity score, or uh, sorry, the, uh, the FAST score. So that was just a quick run through of, of, uh, of the forest attribute scoring approach. In the guide, if, it's, if the score uh, that you get on the ground is greater than six, then in most cases, it would be considered um, uh, good, good in uh, ecosystem integrity. It would probably be sufficiently established, and it would probably be old. Um, but there's some exceptions to that. I, I won't deal with that in detail. But the the, the scoring the scoring procedure itself is a useful way of kind of um, going through that process and deciding on uh, on on uh, figuring out the integrity. And then two two different people doing the same thing could usually come up with the same answer. Here's just some examples of some fast fast scores. Uh, XM dry maritime 01 site, a very low fast of 0 0.5. So this is a densely regenerated stand with uh, nothing more than mosses on the ground, probably not much in the way of course we did debris or snags or bots or um, so relatively low uh, integrity score, a fast score. Here's a DMO3, about 100 years old with a fast of five. So you can see some elements there, better developed understory, greater variation in tree size. Um, and then over here on the right, uh, XMO5, a sword for insight with a fast of six or 6.5. So this is approaching what we might consider to be um, sufficiently established for a, a plant community. And um, depending on the number of vots, et cetera, and other features that uh, might be considered to be an old forest. And in any case, a, a good candidate for recruitment of, of future old growth where in, the, in these areas where there isn't much current old. Um, uh, there's some, yeah, I think I'm gonna skip this slide just cause I'm looking at the clock and I'm gonna, Pre-stratification is an important element of this, and you know that's a sort of a first step where you'd go in and, and sample further. But um, yeah, I'm gonna just skip that one quickly. Um, uh, applications outside the GBRO. This was developed for the GB uh, Great Bear Rainforest, but uh, as you can imagine, here's a here's here's a map of just a, an overview map of old and and uh, old growth and, and 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 other, which is generally younger forest on the coast primarily. Uh, old Great Bear Rainforest in this area, but you can see on Vancouver Island and the Georgia Basin, uh, dominated by second growth forests. And many of these are quite, these are older second growth forests. So older than 80 years, uh, some of them 140, 150 years old. So you can see where a tool like this would be useful in assessing forests where we uh, want to recruit um, uh, 
younger for us, the, for the future old. Um, so yeah, applying applying uh, applying this outside the GVRO is as uh, after we develop, we realize yeah, this is a handy tool for for using elsewhere, and it has been used elsewhere quite successfully. So initially designed, just a summary here. Initially designed as an EBM tool, but since been applied elsewhere, as I say, on the Sunshine Coast and Vancouver Island, assessing second growth for their conservation value and uh, old growth recruitment potential, and it, as I say, has potential for wider application. Structured repeatable assessment procedure. Uh, allowing field crews to consistently assess ecosystem integrity on the ground. And we've put on training courses and we got pretty good feedback from crews. Um, you know, we, we feel confident that it works pretty well on the ground. And, um, and when you walk into a forest stand, you kind of, you know, you, it's, it's kind of telling us what we think it should be telling us. Um, repeatable by different crews. And, but there's a but here, but, but, but emphasizing ground sampling, it, it does emphasize ground sampling and thus is not necessarily practical for assessing large landscapes. So yeah, labor intensive, uh, good for, uh, in the, you know, assessing cut block, potential cut blocks and pulling out areas that, um, uh, that fit the criteria of either old forest or sufficiently established and, and used as a kind of a tool in planning reserves. But for covering large areas, it's, um, we, need, we need a more of a GIS approach that can then be uh, ground truth based on, on, on an approach like the, like the fast scoring approach. And um, that's a segue into um, our next uh, uh, project here, which we're currently working on with Western Forest Products and the Namgis First Nation uh, in TFL 37 on Northern Vancouver around the, the um, Nimbikish area. And uh, they're working on a, a integrated resource management plan uh, for the area. And they're interested in ecosystem integrity. And they've got a, big list of ecological values that they're incorporating into this planning, including cultural uh, values, uh, the First Nations values, understory veg and understory species, cultural use of understory and overstory species like uh, Devil's Club and Western Red Cedar are two obvious ones. And, and we, Adele and I agreed to help with the, with the goal of providing a status map or a kind of a report card of forest condition, integrity, recovery, uh, kind of a today time zero and also into the future. So they want to use this also to model future uh, scenarios of, of uh, uh, you know, future forest modeling in the, in, the, in the TFL. And the big thing here, we're encouraged by LIDAR technology because it's provided, it can provide some improved assessment of stand height and structural complexity metrics and um, uh, compared with what we were used to using from forest cover. So we're, we were encouraged by that and we kind of got, uh, sucked into this because you know this 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 is looking like interesting stuff so um so the essentials as i say cooperative work with wfp and the, and the nam geese and a bunch of other people involved um stuart glenn's kind of the kingpin here he tells us what to do or, or we i guess we tell him what to do but he asks us <laughs> he's, he's he, he tells us what he thinks we want, want, want that he wants us to do anyways we do something and they report back so steve platt he's the gis guy so he's been helping us out with it um, GIS aspects, and we've uh, we're focused, kind of focusing on available inventory attributes that are that we consider to be useful indicators of recovery and integrity. And here's a list of five of them: canopy complexity, stand age, tree species diversity, polygon size, and landscape context. So these are things that we can get from the forest inventory, and uh, as well as the uh, uh, lidar coverage. And um, so the, these were the things that we kind of decided to use in this sort of predictive approach to uh, uh, mapping integrity. And the base polygons for analysis are forest inventory polygons. And then we can overlay terrestrial ecosystem mapping polygons and a variety of other polygons on top of that to, to take it further. This is just a LIDAR image here. I'm gonna explain a little bit more about that. Oh, here we are, LIDAR. So LIDAR, you see it in the literature spelt or uh, capitalized in various ways, but it stands for light detection and ranging systems. And it uses light laser light to measure distances in the, in the last 20 or so years, there's been some pretty significant advances in this technology. And it's, uh, it's a pretty, uh, it's a pretty useful tool. It's uh, they essentially produce these um, laser point clouds that pr provide extremely accurate 3D measurements of things like vegetation and buildings. And uh, that can be used for a whole bunch of stuff, but uh, it's very well suited to measuring tree heights and forest canopy complexity. And this fancy program called Fusion, developed by the USDA, kind of takes these clouds and turns them into an image, an actual image of that forest, which is, yeah, it's pretty, pretty, pretty impressive stuff. 
And there's numerous um, metrics that can be calculated from uh, lots of math that can be done from this, these point clouds and, and uh, characterizing canopy roughness and uh, rugosity and vertical complexity index, canopy relief ratios. There's a whole bunch of, these are just three of many that we looked at and we had, a, had, had Del and I had a lot of fun uh, looking at um, these fusion images of, of portions of the TFL and you can do transex, you can look at individual pixels, you can create these images um, that actually, you know, every tree, that's an, these are actual trees. I mean, the, 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 it, it's very good at mapping individual trees and uh, gaps and structural characteristics of the forest. And uh, uh, it's all geo reference, so you can stand on the ground and look at what that actually looks at on the ground. The bottom image here is a, is, is a LIDAR canopy height model. So the red is taller trees, uh, yellow is uh, shorter trees. The purple here is the, is the, are the gaps on the ground. So you can line this up with some the actual uh, uh, metrics, the um, uh, LIDAR metrics, and look at how that varies. So on the left here, we've got old forest. On the right, younger forest, I think 50 or 60 years old versus uh, older forest up to uh, 300, I think, on the left. Anyways, as you can see, these, these, these um, metrics vary um, with, with structure and age. In the end, we... Um, so we did a lot of this at various various transit, various age age classes, and comparing old and young, and different structures within old and within young. And um, so, yeah, we examined several lidar metrics, included that Rumpel was uh, the best suited to capturing variation in canopy structure. These other ones were useful as well, but they didn't add significant info in our mind, and uh, so we decided to use Rumpel. So you think of Rumpel as a you drape a sheet over a, over the forest canopy and all the dips and doolies. Um, and you kind of measure all that that area, and uh, you compare that with uh, just the, the, the ground area, and uh, you come up with a, a rumpel value. So it's uh, how wrinkled is that is that canopy basically? Here's a graph on the left. The uh, blue uh, line is the average uh, by by um, age class from zero to nine. Um, as you can see, it it increases generally with age class, but there's a lot of variation within age classes. So it's not just telling you how old it is, it's telling you what, what are the, what's the structure variation within these age classes as well. On the right, um, again, by age class, but each age class is divided up into height class. And so you can see there's a general increase in Rumpel, but it also varies by height class um, and not always in a direct manner. So it is telling you something additional to just age. It's telling you, you know, what's that, what, what is the structural variation within that, that age? So then we can take that info we can take all that um, those criteria and use it in a uh, GIS fashion to look at the landscape. And here on the left is a photograph, air photograph of, of, a, of an area of forest uh, on the lower part here, 458 old years old year old forest, contrast with the young forest to, to just above that. This is here's a, um, a lidar image. Now this is this is actually a map of Rumpel. So each of these 40 meter by 40 meter square pixels has a rumpel value associated with it. So you can, you know, for any given polygon, you can create a mean and a standard deviation. So you can um, look at the variation within that polygon. So um, high rumpel means here's the scale over here, red and orange are, are higher values, green and blue are lower values. So this old forest on the bottom here, uh, here's a, 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 a LIDAR image uh, of it. And you can see the structural complexity. You can see the gaps in the ground and the variation in tree height. Rumpel score of 7.3. On the right over here, a younger stand uh, with less structural development. Some, but not, uh, but not as much as over here, uh, with a, a lower Rumpel score of 2.5. So, so that that's that's telling us a lot about the, that those those polygons. And so you can look at the second growth areas, and you can look at the variation in, in, in structure. And um, you can kind of score them accordingly. So as, with that as the basis for looking at, um, you know, how we would uh, predict, basically predict ecosystem integrity within a polygon, we can start with uh, canopy complexity using Rumpel and also the standard deviation of Rumpel, kind of normalize that to give it a little bit more weight. We can add to that stand age. We can score it based on age, but not just directly based on age. We would, uh, based on our ecosystem recoveries, uh, previous work, you know, things happen relatively slowly early on in the stand, but after it reaches about 100 years, then, you know, the, the score increases as far as uh, 
structural development and understory development and all, all those other factors. So we can, we can create an age score from that, which we did. Tree species diversity can be, we can get that from the forest cover uh, data and, and we can modify it by the dominance. So if, you know, if there's three, three species in a polygon and one is 80% uh, of that polygon, then it wouldn't score as high as if those, those three species were more evenly um, divided within that polygon. Um, so you create a score based on that. Polygon size, and here we emphasize polygons achieving interior forest conditions. So the score increases as that size goes up to a max of five hectares. Um, and we, we played around with this for a while and decided this was kind of the best approach. Um, and it's kind of linked to the next one, landscape context. And landscape context is uh, the most complicated one from a GIS perspective, a lot of math involved in figuring out what goes on around that, uh, that polygon. So we, um, we did a one kilometer buffer and uh, the score is calculated based on the percent of the six of six different forest cover categories from recent disturbance to mature old forest. So the greater percentage of mature and old, the, um, the higher the score. And then that was modified by a couple of other factors. Uh, the percent of the polygon boundary that was adjacent, so this polygon adjacent to, to um, uh, a recent cut and then also uh, uh, adjacent to recent, uh, or sorry, the length of roads per hectare. Um, it, within that within that one kilometer buffer also decreased that score so that that resulted in a landscape context um, uh, score um, so these were more or less evenly weighted individual um, attribute scores are summed to calculate the uh, integrity score for for the polygon so more or less um, more or less equal weighting and um, Here's that same, um, a larger view of that same area. So there's a, this is south of Nimkush Lake on the, uh, Vancouver Island, um, just a portion of that TFL. Um, and as you can see, a variety of, of age classes, there's some really old stands, 459, there's sort of mid-aged, 150, 140. Uh, there's some younger 80 year old stands and then there's some uh, recent, recent um, uh, cut blocks. Um, and so you turn that into this um, using the, the, the int uh, integrity score uh, based on those six uh, factors. And um, so you've kind of predicted what the integrity is uh, within these uh, polygons. And it's, it's related to age, but as you can see, some of the, um, uh, you know, most of the old, old polygons are, are, are darker red. Here's this, this scale over here. Uh, but some of the younger, uh, you know, mid-age polygons are also also have high integrity because maybe they've got greater species diversity, or they've got better landscape context, or, or, or higher rumple values, or uh, so. So it's adding information to just the the age in order to give you a, an idea of what that um, what the integrity of those of those stands might be. Um, here's a graph of. Um, Rumpel uh, with with integrity score, so you can see Rumpel, uh, the the lidar metric Rumpel, does drive it quite a bit, but um, and and as it should because uh, canopy complexity is an important factor, but then other factors, uh, you know, like landscape context, size, uh, species diversity, etc., are going to impact that, and and uh, in terms of de deciding the final um, score. Um, right, so we. Once you've done that, what do you what do you do? What do you how do you report it out? Um, what do you use it for? Um, well, it, you know you can summarize those values for entire management units and come up with you know average integrity values. You can you can categorize it in various ways. Um, you can start defining uh, you know uh, as we as we've done over here. Uh, very good and excellent integrity, and you can you can look at biochromatic units, landscape units. You can overlay TEM and uh, do some summaries that way. You can uh, so you can look at current condition, and you can also use it for uh, as WFP is working on now, modeling it into the futures to look at future scenarios. Um, the old growth uh, technical advisory panel produced uh, deferral maps uh, and recruitment area maps. And you can, you know, you, can, you could overlay those. I've got an example of that uh, to help refine that information. The kind of stage we're at now, we need data from a large study area, uh, at least an entire TFL. And we, and we just got, we've just 
getting close to getting that now to, ha to have a look at in order to better understand the full range of scores from highly disturbed to relatively pristine habitats and defining work towards defining meaningful integrity classes. Um, and that's, that's kind of the stage we're at right now with this. Here's a overlay of terrestrial ecosystem mapping on this uh, integrity mapping and uh, you know, maybe you want, uh, maybe you're interested in rare ecosystems, and uh, you know, for the uh, for the O1 and the and the CLUHXM, which I think is red listed, you 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 know, you're looking for an element occurrence of that, or you're you're creating a reserve, and you want to find some higher integrity examples of that. Well, you could use this map to to help you do that. Um, uh, here's an overlay of. Uh, the provincial old growth deferral uh, areas and uh, recruitment areas that were uh, proposed by the technical technical advisory panel. These blue blobs uh, are some um, uh, old growth priority deferral areas, and the the purple down here are some recruitment uh, polygons that uh, you know don't meet old old old. Um, uh, criteria, but they would be potentially um, good for recruiting old. And then and, and this is again applicable in these southern subzones where there isn't a whole bunch of old left. So, you know, comparing that with this, you might want to take those polygons and uh, uh, t take these integrity polygons and, 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 and refine those sort of provincial level polygons and also add to them, right? You could, you could uh, use it to add other areas that have potential for recruitment, for example. Um, so just another uh, useful application there. And um, yeah, getting towards, I think this is my last slide. So, so just further work and applications. So as I say, further analysis of the entire TFL, in, in, in this case, refinements to scoring and defining meaningful breaks in the range of integrity scores, low, medium, high, or poor, fair, uh, good, and excellent. Um, you know, you need, you need sort of to be able to look at example scores and see what, see what they're actually telling you in order to define some meaningful breaks and, um, and, and on the ground sampling using a technique like LMH72 that I described to confirm and test these relationships, uh, potentially applying this in other areas. And we, we're, we're working with um, other, other TFLs, uh, Western Forest Products, uh, co-managing co uh, TFL 39.2 with Nan Macolas and uh, that's uh, just north of Campbell River. In the, um, um, and then uh, the Hawaiat on TFL 44 near Banfield on the West Coast, uh, also interested in pursuing something like this. Our current work is focused on characterizing current conditions. Uh, and as I say, uh, the, the Western Forest Prize is also applying this procedure, and them and the, the First Nations to modeling future management scenarios. And so, uh, you know, is integrity, uh, is it improving over time? Is it, is it uh, what's, what's the goal? What's the goal for the average where, where um, you know, if you're planning a reserve design where you want to uh, be able to maximize ecosystem integrity over time, it'll, it would be helpful for that. Yeah, so integrity scoring can be used to set management targets into the future and guide the design and landscape, res uh, landscape reserve networks, and as I say, including old growth uh, recruitment. Um, and then, you know, the, the, the last point here, similar approaches have I think great potential to be applied at the provincial scale uh, to support forest management and conservation initiatives. And looking at the uh, old growth review, key point eight and the recommendations five, 10 and 11, all of those kind of relate to inventory and kind of public information and uh, recruitment, uh, uh, you know, the need for, for that, for better information to, to, to get at that, to get at those points. And, and, and so here's, here's a couple of tools that I think we think would be useful for that, and uh, you know, of course, depending on where you're in the province, they have to be modified a bit. But it's the approach that has uh, applications, I think. And uh, yeah, GIS-based uh, analysis supported by a field sampling program. You know, maybe this is something uh, related to uh, what Beck was back uh, 40 years ago. You know, get some people back out on the ground uh, confirming these these relationships and uh, getting familiar with areas and, and getting serious about. Um, characterizing integrity within the landscape, uh, both in old growth as well as, as, as second growth. Um, right, I think I'm at the end of my slides here and there's a bit of time for
I didn't get too bogged down in anything. There's still some time for discussion. So wonderful. It's kind of a whirlwind tour, but uh, you know. Um, yeah, uh, that was. If you that missed was... anything? <laughs> <Sorry>. Jam-packed presentation. <laughs> Thanks, Alan.